Hello guys, um, we are going to continue from where we stopped on our last video lesson. Uh, so we are going to continue with liquids. So uh, based on the kinetic theory, a liquid should have these following characteristics. So the liquid molecules are close together that they have very little spaces. Thus liquids are much more difficult to compress compared to gas. So, and they are also much more denser at normal conditions. So molecules in the liquids are held together by one or more than one type of attraction forces. And liquid has a definite volume because molecules inside the liquid do not break from the attractive forces. So this molecule, however, can move past one, uh, one by one to another freely so that a liquid can flow, can be poured and follows the shape of its container. So uh, here we are going to learn about what is a vapor pressure. Uh, so vaporization or evaporation is a process where liquid changes to gas under any conditions. So to understand better what is actually vaporization, so this imagine that this is a half year beaker. Okay, so um, now after one hour we found out that uh, the volume of the water has decreased. So why is it that uh, in this open beaker the volume of the water has decreased? So this is due to so water molecules on the surface gain enough energy from the surrounding okay and when it gain enough now energy it is able to break through the intermolecular forces from the surface and eventually vaporize to form gas so this phenomenon is also known as uh, evaporation so this evaporation process can occur uh, under any temperature however Today, if we seal the beaker using a wrapper or whatsoever, so the water can no longer escape from the surface of water. So as a, that means escape out from the beaker, okay? So as a result, the water vapor collide with the wall of container, okay? And eventually exert the form of pressure. So such pressure is also known as vapor pressure. So after the collision, the wall contain uh, the wall of the container particles lost its energy. So it lost its energy it undergoes condensation. So the process of vaporization and condensation keep on occurring until it achieves a dynamic equilibrium. Where in this case, the rate of evaporation is the same with the rate of condensation, whereas the uh, the reaction is still ongoing. So such vapor pressure exerted in such condition is also known as a saturated vapor pressure. So vapor pressure of a liquid is directly proportional to temperature. So graph below shows the relationship between vapor pressure of and temperature of a few liquid. We have ether, ethanol, and water. So as you can see from here, uh, ether has the highest vapor pressure. While water has the lowest vapor pressure. Okay, and this is a curve, a positively, uh, a positively uh, derived curve. So this shows that as temperature increase, so particles gain more kinetic energy to vaporize, hence collide more frequently with the wall container. So therefore, vapor pressure increase with the temperature. So everything above the curve is liquid and everything below the curve is gas. So we're going to understand why is it that the ether has the higher vapor pressure compared to ethanol than in water. So when we say that a substance is easily vaporized, it is due to it has weak intermolecular forces. Where in this case, ether are holes by weak van der Waal forces. Ethanol has a lower vapor pressure than ether has a lower vapor pressure than ether because ethanol are held by strong hydrogen bond. Whereas water has the lowest vapor pressure since water molecules form more hydrogen bond compared to that of ethanol. Hence, it has the highest intermolecular forces. So the molecule is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the external pressure. So the more boiling point of a liquid in the temperature at this is boil when the external pressure is one atmosphere. So from the graph, it is proven that substance with a high vapor pressure has a higher, lower boiling point. So as you can see, at one atmosphere, ether boils at 45 degrees Celsius, ethanol 78, while water is 100. So as a conclusion here, we can say that higher the vapor pressure, lower the boiling point of the substance involved. 
So depending on the external pressure, boiling point changes accordingly. So under low pressure, boiling point of the substance is lower. So for example, if we have 0 0.5, so it may be boiled lower than expected. So you can see this one, this one, and this one. Whereas conversely, in a higher vapor pressure, the boiling point increase. So this is the phenomenon used to explain why is it that when we cook water in a high altitude, it does not require very high temperature to boil the water. Volatility of, is the tendency of a substance to become gas. In liquid, volatility of a substance depends on the vapor pressure of the substance involved. So we say higher the vapor pressure, higher the volatility of the substance. Therefore, from the graph, we can see that volatility increase from water to ethanol to ether. So similar to volatility of a substance depends on intermolecular forces that hold it there. Weaker the intermolecular forces, easier for the substance to be vaporized. Therefore, the more volatile liquid it is. So that is all for the liquid. Immediately we go to the gas, a solid, sorry, immediately we go to the solid. So solid is defined as a substance that has a structural rigidity and resistance to change the shape of volume. So solid can be generally divided into two broad categories, namely crystalline solid and also amorphous solid. So as you can see from the diagram here, what distinguishes between a crystalline solid and an amorphous solid is, so crystalline solid generally has a well-defined shape because they have particular particles occur in an orderly arrangement, whereas amorphous solid has poorly defined shape because they have salt, the particles lack long-ranging ordering through the samples. So examples of crystalline solids are table salts. And examples of amorphous solids are glasses. So we're going to understand what is actually a crystal lattice and unit cell. So crystalline solids are packed tightly throughout in all these three-dimensional array, which all the particles are identical sphere and are arranged in the identically in the same manner. So such crystalline solid is sometimes called as crystalline lattice. So what is a unit cell? So a unit cell is a basic repeating structural form of the crystal solid lattice. So each sphere represents an atom, ion, or molecule, and hence is called as a lattice point. So in many particles, rather than form as several atoms, their, uh, their molecules are identically arranged at each lattice point. For simplicity, however, we assume that each lattice point occupied by an atom. So this is what we call as the lattice point. And with pictures of the lattice point, we make what we call as a unit cell. And with pictures unit cell, we make what we so call as the uh, crystal lattice. So let's together understand how could uh, what are the basic unit cell that we have. So we have lombohedra, cubic, tetragonal, triclinic, monochromic autorhombic and also hexagonal. So these are the seven basic primitive unit cell and each of them has their special characteristic. So in here I'm not going to dis explain further about their characteristic. You may have a look at here on your own and if you require any assistance please do hesitate to let me know. Then we also have what we so call as a multi-primitive cell where this multi-primitive cell is made of simple cubic cell, body center cubic and also face center cubic. So this is a three-dimensional arrangement of a simple cubic cell, body center cubic, and also hexagonal close pack. Where as you can see from here, a simple cubic cell is made from eight corner. Whereas a body center cubic is made of eight corner plus one particles at the center of the uh, cubic. And face center cubic, where each of the faces have one particles on the so if we cut through the uh, cubicle cell, imagine you have something like this. So uh, each uh, this uh, what this body center, okay? Let's say it is joined up by eight edges, uh, by eight corners. So in another word, each corner will occupy one over eight of the uh, unit cell. Whereas in face center, so the edge, uh, the edge of the uh, faces, okay? It contains half particles, so therefore each phase has half of the particles at top. 
So if we cut through the images that we saw just now in here, so this is what we have for simple cubic cell, where it is made from eight corner. So eight corner times one over eight of particles, we have one particles per cubic cell. For body center cubic, imagine when we cut through to the set to the sample just now, we found out that it is made out of eight corner and one atom at the center. So how many number of particles are involved in here? We have 8 corner plus 1 body center, therefore 2 particles per unit cell. Whereas for face center cubic, we have 6 faces, each of them has half of the atom at the uh, at it. So we have 8 corner plus 6 face center, so 8 times 1 over 8 plus 6 times 1 over 2. So we have 4 particles per unit cell. So in terms of packness, we can deduce that a face center cubic has usually a more, more close pack compared to the other cubic cell. So this is what about the structural looks like. Next we're going to have a look is allotropy. So allotropy is element that exists more than one structure under the same state of matter. For example, oxygen can exist as oxygen gas and ozone. Carbon can exist as diamond, graphite and also fullerene. Phosphorus can exist as white phosphorus and red phosphorus. Sulfur can exist as alpha sulfur and beta sulfur. And tin can be uh, said as white tin and also grey tin. So this allotrope can change from one form to another under certain temperature. So for example, for aerobic sulfur to become monoclinic sulfur, the transition temperature is 95.6. So in another word, when everything is above the temperature, the electrodes are more stable in monoclinic sulfur, while below transition temperature, aerobic sulfur will be more stable. So these are the comparisons for the uh, between diamond and graphite. Uh, this one. So uh, diamond, each carbon is surrounded by four other carbon atoms in tetrahedral shape, building a strong giant covalent network among the carbon carbon. So because of this, giant is extremely hard and strong. Whereas in graphite, each carbon is surrounded by three other carbon atoms in a planar, building a sheet like honeycomb's hexagonal structure. So each layer of the graphite is held by a near weak Vanderwall forces. Since all four valence electrons is used in the diamonds, so there is no delocalized electron in the structure, making diamond an insulator. Whereas for graphite, since there are only three electrons used for bonding, Therefore, there are one unbonded electron delocalized electron in between the layer, so making graphite a good conductor of electricity. So, uh, based on the understanding just now, we say that carbon in the diamond is sp3 hybridized, whereas carbon in graphite is sp2 hybridized. In terms of conductivity of electricity, diamond is a insulator, while graphite is a conductor. So diamond has a higher density compared to graphite. So these are the applications of the diamond and graphite. The diamond can be used as diamond cutter and also jewelry. As for uh, graphite, it can be used as rubicant and also electrodes. Another allotrope is fullerene. So uh, fullerene has the uh, most simplest is C60. So uh, fullerene can exist in the carbon nanotube, a cylindrical fullerene which extraordinary macroscopic properties including high tensile strength, high electrical conductivity, high ductility and high heat conductivity, and relatively chemical even. So a lot of study has been used towards this carbon nanotube. So with this, that is all for the first video of the liquid and solid. So we continue the phase diagram later.